Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the I Worship service of Eastminster United Church in Belleville, Ontario. It is Sunday, the 20th of June today, and it is Father's Day. So for all the, those who are tuning in and are fathers, we wish you a very pleasant and happy day. Also, I have one announcement before we begin our worship. Um, it is that I hope this is the beginning of the end of the pandemic. I'm rather hoping that with our opening next week for in-person worship, that we are going to be open pretty well for good. And uh, unfortunately, there are some strict limitations from the government still about opening. So we're going to have to register at least this one week, that's next week, for our service, we're only allowed 15% in the uh, congregation of its capacity. And uh, please register, either call the church office or send an email to reception at eastminster.ca. Um, the following week, uh, the province is supposed to move into stage two of its uh, opening uh, exercises and uh, we think we'll be able to manage with that level without uh, a registration. So uh, we're hoping this is just a one week thing where there's registration for services. So hopefully the beginning of the end and uh, we look forward to uh, meeting with you in person over the summer and during this time and for the, at least the remainder of the year, I have promised before we we'll keep our online worship service going. So uh, please join us for that if you can't come in uh, uh, to our presence on Sunday mornings. Well, it is Father's Day, as I said, and uh, let's begin with a reprise of the Spark Puppeteers and their Father's Day presentation. Good morning, friends. How's everyone this morning? Well, you're probably wondering what I'm up to today. Welcome to Stacy's Cooking Show. I like to call it Heaven's Kitchen. Today's a special day. It's Father's Day. I'm sure you found some special ways to show love to the father figures in your life today. It could be a father or a grandfather or some other special person who loves you and takes care of you while you're a kid. I decided that I would make something special for my grandpa. Because we've increased our family bubble this week, I can see my grandma and grandpa again. I'm so happy to be able to spend time with them. Whenever you think about what to give someone as a gift, you have to think about what's important to them and what their favorite things are. So my grandpa's favorite thing to eat is fruit. He loves fruit and he really loves God. And my grandma was telling me all about this thing in the Bible called the fruits of the spirit. And so, thum, 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 what a great gift idea. I thought you might like to watch me make a fruit of the spirit salad for my grandpa, in case you wanted to make something like it for the special person in your life. That's right, fruit of the spirit. I'll tell you all about it while I make this special gift for Father's Day. First, you need to wash your hands really well, like sing happy birthday while you're washing your hands. That's how you know it's long enough. And you'll see that my mom also tied my hair back. You don't really need an apron like me, but a spoon and a bowl would be really good. And it's important that all the fruit gets washed. My mom helped me with cutting up some of the fruit too. You shouldn't use a knife without checking with your family, even if you're making this as a surprise. We have here a bunch of ingredients for my salad. For this recipe, there are nine fruits. Let's see what we have. Ooh, we've got some love strawberries, some joy oranges, some peace apples, a little patience banana, a few kindness blackberries. Oh, and those goodness grapes. Blueberries of faithfulness, kiwi of gentleness, 
And lastly, some mango self-control. Mmm. So let's get started. Every good cooking show gives you some information while they're cooking. And I'll tell you about the fruits we're using today. The Bible tells us that the fruits of the Spirit are the ways Jesus showed us to live a good life and to show others God's love. And so, let's talk about them. The first ingredient in our Fruit of the Spirit salad is love strawberries. They're red, and sometimes when you slice them, they look kind of like a heart. I'm going to put some love in my fruit bowl. Love is sometimes really easy, don't you think? When people treat us well and make us feel good, we feel love. But what about when love's hard? I wonder if God thinks we should show love even when it's hard. Like when my mom's upset because I broke the rules and her face looks disappointed. Do I still love her even when it's hard? Well, Grandma says that that's just the kind of love that Jesus showed us and wants us to try to show. The next ingredient is these joy oranges. I think they remind me of joy because they look kind of like a smile. We'll put some of those in there. Grandma said joy is a big happiness no matter what's happening. Is it possible to have joy when things are not good? Like even in a pandemic when we can't play at the playground? Well, I've learned that I can have joy when things are not good because even though I'm sad to not go to the playground, I know that I'm helping my community stay safe and healthy, which makes me big, big happy. The next ingredient is peace apples. I don't really watch the news, but I've heard it from my playroom when my family's watching, and I know there seems to be a lot of anger and fighting right now. It's something about people being treated differently because of how they look, and that's not right. It doesn't seem peaceful in the world all the time. But Grandma told me that I can feel at peace in the middle of bad things if I pray to God to help me. And then even if things are crazy around me, I can have peace in my heart. Let's see what's next. Oh, Patience Banana. Oh, I find it hard to be patient when the bananas come home from the store and they're not quite ready to eat yet because they're so green. I have to wait a day or so for them to yellow up. That's hard sometimes. And remember back last summer when I was fishing with my friends Chad and Bones? You need a lot of patience to go fishing. Patience is a hard one for me, but Grandma said it's another thing that God really wants me to work on. Next, let's throw in some kindness blackberries. Grandma said kindness is so important. We're supposed to treat others the way we want to be treated. I think the world needs a lot of that right now. I can show kindness to others no matter what they look like, no matter what they smell like, no matter how old they are or how they dress, no matter what. My grandpa's really kind. He treats everyone the same. And grandma said Jesus also showed great kindness and Jesus is the number one example. And here are, mmm, goodness grapes. Goodness me, this is looking like a nice salad. This makes me think that God's so good to me and I should be good to others. And these are blueberries of faithfulness. Faithfulness means keeping our promises. God keeps his promises to us so we need to keep our promises to him and to the people around us. Sometimes I say to my mom, I promise I'll clean my room, but okay, I can get distracted and I don't really like cleaning my room, but my mom expects me to be faithful to my promise and so does God. So we're almost done. So how about some kiwis of gentleness? Kiwi has this rough brown outside but inside, they're all soft. Sometimes, being a Christian means that we stand up and speak up for what we know is right. But also, being a Christian means that we treat people with kindness. My grandpa's very gentle and kind. He's a good example of how Jesus acted towards people and how God wants me to act. 
And the last one is the mango of self-control. Oh, I love mango. I could eat and eat and eat mango, but I have to hold myself back and not eat too much because I'm not the only one in this house. That's self-control. Sometimes self-control is also not pouting and shouting when I'm not allowed to do what I want to do when I want to. Grandma said adults have to practice self-control even more than kids because they don't have anyone telling them to stop doing the things that are bad for them. Jeepers, I better get this self-control thing in hand before I grow up. So there we have all these great fruits. I'm going to stir them all together. Look at how beautiful it is. Grandma said that God gives us all love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But that's up to us to practice them and make them grow. This will make us grow in faith and love for God. And we'll be doing what Jesus showed in his life. He had all these things. None of us are perfect. Well, except Jesus. But God wants us to do our best. Normally, I don't think prayer is a part of a cooking show, but I feel like I need to pray for God's help to grow these things. Dear God, thank you for the fruits of the Spirit that you gave us. Help us to practice love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control every day so we can grow in faith and treat others the way God wants us to. Help us to always think of others and be compassionate. And God, please bless the people in our lives who father us every day, and thank you for the examples they are in our lives. Amen. My grandpa's going to love this gift. And oh, I think a dollop of whipped topping on the top will make it even better. I hope you have a chance to show the special person in your life how much you appreciate them today. Happy Father's Day to all your special people. Bye, friends. Well, many thanks again to our young people for a reprise of their Father's Day uh, service, which they brought to us last year. And uh, let us continue. Let us pray. God of glory, on this Father's Day, we come to you in thanks for the families that we have. We give thanks for all the faithful fathers who largely, without a rule book, muddle through and help their children along the way. We give thanks, too, that when we are lacking in support and the personal presence of a, a father, that we have a Heavenly Father who helps us along the way of life. And in recognition of your role, in recognition of your being, we draw near to you now for worship. Enlighten our hearts, O Lord, heal our spirits, encourage us in life, comfort us in any time of need. But above all in these moments, our hearts reach out to you. We come to acknowledge, we come to listen, we come to worship. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Just not like I
I'm reading today from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 4, reading verses 35 through 41, and let us hear the Word of God. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving a crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. May God bless this reading to our hearts and our minds and our understanding. Amen. Well, the DUKW, or Duck Boat, is a wheeled amphibious vehicle that was used by the U.S. military at the, the latter stages of the Second World War and also during the Korean War. They were later sold off as surplus and uh, they were picked up by businesses here and there. And uh, with modifications, of course, they were used as tourist boats and uh, they were brought into various uh, rivers and lake areas uh, and they would uh, be a part of sightseeing tours. And people would pay uh, up to $30, $35 to get a tour of some lake and have the joy of coming off road and into the water. Now normally these boats were safe enough, but you may recall the incident that happened. It was shortly after 7 p.m. on the evening of the 19th of July in 2018. Uh, a modified duck boat carrying 31 people pulled out uh, onto Table Rock Lake in Branson, Missouri, and the crew may not have heard the warnings about uh, severe thunderstorms that were coming up and approaching quickly. The, when they were out in the water, the winds picked up and the duck boat struggled with um, only three foot, one meter waves 
and it struggled and the, the canopy that was around it and the windows that were designed to protect people from the elements, from the sun and rain and water, the spray, um, it actually prevented people from getting out and off the boat easily and it, it wasn't a big lake but the ensuing tragedy was almost unthinkable as only 14 of those 31 people made it out alive on that what would have been supposedly a fun excursion onto the lake at Table Rock. Now I wonder if that situation, and I've shown you some pictures of it, would have been that different from the experience of Jesus and the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. It was also called Lake Gennesaret uh, in Luke, and it, it as well is not a large body of water, it's big enough, but you wonder if the storms on that lake would have been, you know, really great or that bad. New Testament scholar William Barclay wrote that Gennesaret was actually notorious for storms. They came out of the blue with shatter, shattering and terrifying suddenness. And he talks about uh, how there were numerous ravines along the east and the northeast a side of the lake and uh, these gorges, winds would come down from the heights above and uh, they would be rushing with tremendous force down these gorges and, and, and then suddenly be released and agitate the waters of the lake in a frightful fashion. And you can well imagine that on smaller boats that were the norm of the day, as they were uh, tossed to and fro in the midst of the storm, it would have been a scary place. And we're told in this story in Mark's gospel that the disciples, who, some of whom were seasoned fishermen, were uh, in great fear. Jesus, meanwhile, is asleep at the stern of the boat. And the disciples were filled with so much fear that they woke Jesus up and they said, Jesus, Jesus, what are you doing? Don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus, it seems, rose, wearied perhaps. And he looked out and he said, quiet, be still. And the wind died down and the waters calmed. Why are you so afraid, said Jesus to the disciples? Have you still no faith? And the disciples looked at one another and they didn't know whether to be more afraid of the storm or maybe the one who has power over the storm. And they looked at each other, who's this? Who is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. And in some ways, if you think about it, if, if you've read this gospel of Mark, we're only in the fourth chapter and already you would think the disciples would have gotten it by now. Um, they had seen Jesus cast out evil spirits. They had seen him heal a paralytic. They had seen him heal leprous individuals. They had seen him heal a man with a withered hand. They'd heard him teach with authority. They had heard him uh, confound the experts of the law, the Torah. And yet still they're saying, who is this? Jesus, meanwhile, was probably wondering what he had to do to convince them that he was, as the demoniac said in chapter 1, the Holy One of God. I know who you are, says the demoniac, the Holy One of God. So why are you afraid, asks Jesus. Have you still no faith? After all these signs, have you still no faith? I think Jesus' question was a good one. And it's still a good question today. Because even though we may know the rest of the story, 
the story of Jesus. And uh, we've had a couple of thousand years of church and theology and understanding behind us. Many of us continue to live in fear from time to time, uncertainty, angst. Have you still no faith, asked Jesus? And the story of Jesus, this story of him calming the sea, it tells us a good deal about Jesus and about God. It, it tells us something about God's power. It reveals something about God's love and care. It, it gives the follower of Christ a reason to trust in Christ to, and to, to be at peace in the storms of life. If you've ever read the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, you'll find there the apostle. And the apostle Paul, he is imprisoned at this point. He is staring in the face of death and what may happen to him as he faces Caesar on trial. And yet, despite it all, as he writes to his followers and those who are following Christ with him at the churches that he formed, he he has this peace. He has this inner joy in him. He calls it a peace that passes all understanding. You see, Paul got it. Paul really got it. And whatever he had, most of us find it hard to live with that level of trust ourselves. When we're going through the storms of life, we find it difficult when the winds blow upon us, when the heavens thunder, when the waters come up and the rains fall upon us. Fear isn't that far behind. Why are you afraid though, says Jesus? Have you still no faith? Think about when you face life's problems, when these problems cause within us a tempest of doubt and uncertainty. You know, there are times in life when we hardly know what to do, when we're at a crossroads perhaps and don't know which path to take. We, we fret, we wonder, have difficulty making decisions. If only we would turn to Jesus, says New Testament scholar William Barclay, and say, Lord, what would you have me do? The way would become clear. Because God's ways, if we're open to them, there's something that bring peace, tranquility. What about anxieties? The anxiety that you face, sometimes life throws us things that cause us to, to worry and worry and worry. And we worry about ourselves, about our health, about um, the future, about those we love. I was having a conversation this past week about one of my children. I won't go into any detail about it. I was trying to make something right for them. I use the plural. Uh, it was one, but uh, the woman at the other end of the phone is listening to me. And as I explained, and I said to her eventually, like, do you have any children? And there was an evident smile on the end of the phone when she said, yes, it was just in the way she said it. It was like she knew what I was talking about finally, that, uh, that, that she would have uh, worries from time to time about her own children and uh, I knew then she she knew what I was talking about and you know children can cause us untold worry whether it's when they're young or whether they're teenagers or even as adults when we think they're completely launched angst why are you so afraid says Jesus have you still no faith? I remember my mother telling me one time, and she, she was referring to me in my teenage years, and 
It was a time, I guess, when I had given her the odd difficulty. Um, and uh, she said, David, there came a time when I just had to trust in God. I couldn't do anything else. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and there just seemed to be nothing going on. And so many times I prayed, I was just weary. And I said to God, I couldn't do anything with you anymore. Couldn't even pray anymore. And I said to God, I can only leave you, leave him with you. And, uh, and then look what happened. It was probably just a, a year or two after that, that I was standing by my mother's bedside and letting her know that I felt the Lord's call into the ministry. Have you no faith, says Jesus? Perhaps we need to trust God. God more and, and know that he's going to get us through the storms and the uncertainties and the doubts and the anxieties. And then I, I think about that storm we call sorrow. A few years ago, I was uh, over in Northern Ireland and I was staying with one of my cousins and this particular cousin had lived with us while he was uh, training and uh, lived with us for about half a dozen years or so. He's 10 years older than me, but because he lived with us, he is as much a big brother as, as he is a big cousin. And uh, anyway, when we got together, I stayed with them for a couple of even, uh, nights and uh, uh, in the evenings, we had a, a lot of laughs together as we reminisced about things. And, and then we got talking about some family gatherings and at these gatherings at my, grandmother's place, um, they were just filled with fun and humor and people teasing one another and there were games and all sorts of things and and, and we're talking about this and the, the, the great meals and all that and then Tom got all religious on me and he said, David, you know, we may not have those kinds of gatherings anymore as a family, but there's coming a time when there will be an even greater gathering and we'll all be gathered around and Jesus will be at the head. And he said, do you know that? Do you know that? And I smiled and I said, I do. And then two weeks ago, I called Tom. I just received news that his eldest child had passed away, young, youngish, middle-aged woman. And uh, I gave him my condolences and I, and I said, I, I can't imagine what you're going through. I just can't imagine. And we talked and we talked for a while. And then Tom echoed those words that he had said to me so long ago. And, and it's in the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of shock, he said he was confident that he would see her again. He'd see her again. Most of us, we don't have to get too old before we face death of some sort. And when it's close to us, it can be very, very hard. There can be a lot of pain and suffering and sorrow. But even in those kinds of storms, God's with us. And I think of that old gospel hymn. It goes like this, when the long night has ended and the storms come no more. I think this is what my, my cousin was passing along. Let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore. In that land where the tempest never comes, Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. And then the chorus, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast. Let me stand in the hollow of your hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. 
Why are you so afraid? That's what Jesus asked the disciples. Have you still no faith? You know, here we are, and we know the rest of the story of Jesus. We know the story of the cross. We know the promises of the resurrection. My cousin Tom and his dear wife, I, I'm sure they, they hurt and they sorrow about what's happened. But I know that deep down, deep in their hearts, they're buoyed and they're upheld by faith. They're buoyed by some assurance that God has given them. They're buoyed by the hope of the Christian faith, the hope of Christ, the hope of the resurrection. And that faith, no matter what storm comes your way, can uphold you too.
thank you guys and uh, let us pray again. Gracious God, all creation praises you. And we give you thanks that you have given us so much. You've given us every good thing and you've given us Jesus who came to reveal more of you to us. We're thankful for Jesus' teaching. We're thankful for the hope that he has given us. And each one of us, we, we go through storms. Some of them are literal and physical. Some are figurative as we battle uncertainty and doubt and anxiety and fear and sorrow and various things. And sometimes like the disciples, we too are slow, slow of mind and slow of faith. We don't always seem to feel your presence or the peace that you can give. But Lord, give us faith. Lord, help us to trust in the one who can still the storm and the one who has passed through death to life so that in whatever we may face, whether it be trial or temptation or times when the waves of life batter us and would push us below the surface, give us fortitude, give us peace, give us that peace that passes all understanding through the faith that can get us through. Lord, give us faith. And on this day also, we, as we come to you and as we gather, we uh, take time to remember the gift of family and the gift of fatherhood. We give thanks for families, for the comfort of our homes and for every father who has shared with us gifts of love and faith. Bless those whose life journey is done, those fathers who are no longer with us, but, but dwell with you. We give thanks for the good things that they have passed on, the things that have made us what we are today. And bless those of us who are fathers today, whether it be those who are fathers of grown children or those who are in the throes of joyous family life and raising little ones. Lord, fill each one with with patience and love and gentleness and self-control and grace and the ability to guide and perhaps most of all, so fill us with a desire for your word and your ways that we would ourselves inspire in our children a love for you and a love for others. Be with all fathers today, O Lord, Give them rest, give them peace, give them joy on this day. We pray in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day again to all the fathers. And let us hear these words of benediction as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you faith. Amen. When the long night has ended, and the storms come no more let me stand in thy presence on that bright peaceful shore in that land where the tempest never comes lord may i dwell with thee when the storm passes by till the storm passes over the
Father. 